Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. This week's video, what are some myths you used to believe? A couple of these things I've addressed in videos before, but I've never made a video specifically about some of the things I didn't, or I used to believe that I no longer believe. The time I didn't know them to be myths and I learned through continuing education uh, and experience that they were not in fact true. Why is this important? Uh, my personal feeling as a teacher, as an instructor is, you have to grow. And when you grow, sometimes you have to realize that the knowledge you're holding on to isn't necessarily true, isn't true at all, um, or requires more context for it to be more true, if that makes any sense. Uh, to me, this is very important in my profession because of what we teach. And, and I've brought this up before as well. Some of the best advice I ever got was, you never know how many lives you'll save with what you teach, but you also know how many people you'll get killed with what you teach. So you have to make sure that what you teach is as correct as possible. And if you do find out something is horribly wrong and not just an opinion issue, or maybe you just evolved to do things a slightly different way, but both ways, the old way and the new way are just as efficient. Um, things that are just factually incorrect, you have to, as much as you can, go back and reach back in the past and try to correct those issues or those fallacies or those mistruths or those omissions with students in, that you've had before. So getting right into it, uh, number one, um, and I think some people will take very, very good pleasure in this, I used to be in the not all the lumens camp. Yes, that's right. I used to believe there was such a thing as just enough light. That I think, and I can't definitively say, because once you learn something, at least in my experience, people I've talked to about this, once you learn something not to be true, it's hard to go back and remember what it was like to think that way. Uh, it's very hard to just ex to to put yourself in a mindset that's no longer to be true. It's what you know, cognitive dissonance. It's it's holding two competing ideas in your head at the same time and trying to believe both of them at the same time, which is it should be impossible. For some people, it's not. I'm just not gifted enough, I guess, to have that kind of condition. Uh, but yeah, I used to believe that there was that there were there was such a thing as too much light. Like you know, there's white walls and mirrors and TV screens and. I attribute some of it to some of the early training I had. Uh, my first low light training was back in the incandescent days when lights were pushing, you know, the big thing was like the, the, the uh, scorpion. It was pushing 60 lumens and that was blazing bright. And then of course Surefire came out with some products that you could put a special bulb in and they'd give you like a crazy 200 lumens but it was only good for 200 minutes. So most people would run the smaller bulb so they'd have an hour long runtime. Light wasn't as evolved as it is now. But one thing that I've learned is that there is no such thing as too many lumens, at least not yet. Uh, what we have is incorrect training or no training at all in regards to how light is used. People mention <clears throat> blinding themselves on their, in their home. And my answer to that has always been, how are you blinding yourself in something that you knew was there? Uh, if you have white walls, then you have to use proper technique to avoid blinding yourself. And you can overcome light blindness just by directing the beam. So if you shine a light in your eyes, for example, and you take the flashlight away in a dark room, you're not going to be able to see anything. In a lit, lit room or mesopic room, you may not be able to see anything. But then if you were to shine the light on what you wanted to see, instantly you can see again. Because uh, you're using the same amount of lumens, <clears throat> so to speak, or the same amount of light saturation to the eye, so to speak, to gather that data. The light that's directed in your eyes is the same amount of light you're directing out. Of course, there's more to it than that, but that's kind of just a succinct way to describe the situation. As far as mirrors in your own home, you know it's there. Don't point the light at it, unless there's a reason to. Uh, shining a light baseboard, shining a light on the ceiling. I've done videos on this. Uh, sometimes people see something and they don't agree with it, so they don't actually try it. And to me, and I've been guilty of this in the past as well, to me that's just kind of nonsensical because if it costs you nothing to check what someone else is saying, then pretty easy. Uh, you can go to the range and be like, oh, we said, you know, you could do this or I could do that. I don't really like it, but I'm going to try it and see if it actually works. And if it works, you may then learn something that you didn't otherwise know. One thing that's always stuck with me, and I don't even remember where I read it, is you cannot learn what you think you already know. And this is where myths come into play. You may know something, but if someone presents contradictory evidence to that thing that you know, it would benefit you greatly to at least spend a little bit of time to see if maybe they are in fact correct. Because there are some things that we know today uh, that we used to think otherwise in the past. Next up is don't use a slide release, slingshot the gun. I've done a video specifically on this topic, but I'm going to kind of approach it from a different way to, to, to arrive at the place where, where I used to think and where some people still think um, that the reasoning behind that. Um, sometimes the argument is mechanical. Well, you know, Glock doesn't call it a slide release. They call it a slide stop or a slide lock. And it's semantics. Granted, it's Glock's product, so they can call their little pieces whatever they want. Um, but I've been, since I've seen the light, 
been using the OEM side release and I haven't had any issues yet and this has been years and years and years. I've used some firearms in the past that had bigger releases, some firearms in the past that had roughly the same size release as a Glock. I can't think of a gun that has one smaller because that, that Glock OEM slide release is pretty small. But anyway, what most of that comes from is the belief that under stress you lose your fine motor skills. And this is not completely correct. In fact, it's more incorrect than it is correct. Uh, there's some argument from layman to professional what the definition of a fine motor skill is. My personal definition is single digit manipulation interacting with other fingers. Um, the trigger, fine motor skill, uh, slide release is going to be a fine motor skill, magazine release is going to be a fine motor skill. Uh, some of those small adjustments that you make in your sight picture can be a fine motor skill. Uh, releasing the bail on a holster or a retention device can be a fine motor skill. So all these other fine motor skills can take place, occupationally dependent, situationally dependent, but there's that one that no one's supposed to be able to do. Now think about this critically, does that even make sense? No, it doesn't. Uh, but people continue to believe it, and I once believed it. And the reason I believed it, I significantly, I don't want to say blame, I blame myself, but the information that led me to believe it came from Bruce Siddle's PPCT program when he talks about catastrophic failure and heart rate causing stress and all these other things, where based on this program that I was learning through my first police academy, I was like, oh my God, you know, like my heart rate's gonna get up to this point, I won't be able to do anything anymore. So I gotta use these caveman motions to shoot guns and do things like that. And it never even occurred to me at the time, and I was much younger then, and that's no excuse, uh, that the trigger, and the magazine release for fine motor skills. But I was doing those pretty efficiently, I would, I'd like to think. You know, I'd like to think I shot pretty well back then. It would up to my instructors to actually give their opinion on that. So this heart rate issue that was raised in PPCT and Siddle's research set a lot of people back some time because Siddle failed to dive completely into the subject. And he also failed to mention that the heart rate is a symptom potential symptom of stress. It's not the cause of anything. So think of it like this, the heart rate is more like a speedometer than it is the engine. It can tell you it's a measurable symptom uh, where you might be in your body's stress, your psychological stress. Your physical stress is gonna vary from person to person based on physical capacity, physical fitness, range of motion, oxygen in the blood, muscle mass, fat content, all these other things. Psychological stress is a little harder to measure, so heart rate just seemed like a quick and easy way to describe how much stress someone is under when they're experiencing the sympathetic nervous system activation. Um, <clears throat> going past that, I just had the opportunity in, in force on force and real world to learn that, no, in fact, you can still do single digit manipulations under sympathetic nervous system activation. Uh, I used to teach um, the, the, the alternate method, which is the slingshot or the over the top method, to students. Uh, and I still mention it in classes, but it's something I've completely gotten away from because <clears throat> I don't believe in putting a training wall in front of my student. So I'm not going to assume somebody that comes into a class can't do something because I'm predicting their future for them, if that makes any sense. So to me, it would be irresponsible for me as an instructor to assume what a student's ultimate skill level is going to be. Because if they're coming to me to learn, then they want to grow. And I'm probably not the last instructor they're going to ever uh, take a class from. I'm probably not their first, depending on where they are in, in their evolution of skills. The thing about firearm skills is if you're not improving, then you are devolving, if you will. Uh, there's no such thing as maintenance. You need to constantly be striving for better and better and better and better skills. That's, of course, my opinion, but I think it, 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 uh, if you look at some of the best shooters out there, and of course, I don't know how you're gonna measure that metric, it's a personal decision, you'll see that they're constantly working on things that they're not good at, and that's something we all need to do. So, not using the slide release, and it may not quite be this, but I almost feel like it's a, it's a cop-out, it's so much easier to be proficient, if you will, with that caveman motion of just grabbing and ripping the slide, but it's not as efficient and it's not as fast, and it can't be as efficient, it can't be as fast. Now, two shooters who are very competent in both methods, there may only be a quarter of a second or maybe even you know, an eighth of a second or even a hundredth of a second difference in their abilities to close the slide in either method. But one is going to be remarkably faster than the other, and that's the one that requires less motion, less transition of hand placement, uh, and allows for quicker, reacquiring uh, of the proper two-handed grip on the handgun. Now, of course, talking about this topic may get me some downvotes, and I'm fine with that. Uh, I just encourage people, just like, you know, this is kind of like a Mia Copa or whatever you want to call it. Um, I once believed it. Um, you're watching my channel, so please do me and yourself a favor, and if you do actually subscribe to the, the mindset of stress is going to keep you from being able to work the slide release, 
do some independent reading on it and see if maybe, of your own volition, you can change your own mind. If I can't change your mind, then you're the next best person to do it. This will also get some grins out of people. Comps on handguns are stupid. I once, more than once probably, uttered that very phrase. This was back when, and again, this is not an excuse, just an explanation. This is back when the handgun was a tertiary weapon system for me. I didn't carry one professionally. I carried one for self-defense only. Um, you know, when I was in the military and the infantry, we had rifles. And, you know, only special high-speed guys got handguns, and not even all of them had handguns. Or if you were like a tanker or a mortarman or something like that. But I didn't have a handgun. Uh, so a handgun to me was kind of like a cool thing to like play with and look at when you got a chance to. Like we had some in the arms room. Like, oh, these are fun. Um, but it wasn't something I carried, it wasn't something I had to pay attention to, it wasn't something I needed to be proficient at. And even if I wanted to be proficient at it, the infantry wasn't going to be like, oh, you're good at a handgun, you get one. Eh, it doesn't work that way. So I didn't really start using handguns seriously until after I left the military. Um, and then I've been using them occupationally ever since. The first time I saw a compensated handgun, I'm like, what is that? And I didn't really understand what I was looking at, and I didn't know a whole lot about ballistics and recoil management and everything like that at the time, because I was still learning, and of course I'm still learning now, but I knew even less then, um, which conversely made me think I knew more, if that makes any sense. Uh, I've always felt like the more you learn, the less you know. Uh, anyway, I shot a comp handgun. It was an older 1911, basically what you might refer to as a gamer gun or a race gun. Anyway. Uh, I thought it was cool, lower power ammo, had very little recoil, but then I, I looked at the way that the comp worked and how violent it was and in low light how bright it was, or at least what I thought was, uh, and I thought to myself, like, no one would ever seriously use one of these for self-defense. Like, they might set their clothes on fire if they have to shoot it from close quarters. Like, that, the muzzle flash is going to be atrocious. Like, this is crazy. And I believed that for many, many, many years. Um, and then right as comps started to get popular again, well, you know what? Let me get one of these and see. And this is go back to the same thing. Like sometimes it's better to just check something out yourself uh, before you move forward in life. And I bought a comp. I can't even remember who made it. Uh, it was from a gun show, and I don't remember if it had a name brand or whatever. But it went on a threaded barrel, and I started playing with it. And as far as design was, it was actually a pretty horrible comp. Um, it didn't do a whole lot for recoil mitigation, but I learned some things pretty quick. One. The muzzle flash with the comp to gun was actually more controlled, and I'm using that in a, as a uh, kind of like a definitive text. When you shoot a crown barrel, such as a non-comped handgun, the muzzle flash can come out in a cone uh, and can be pretty overpowering depending on the ammunition. Whereas with the compensator, it's pushing that blast, that muzzle blast, in you know basically one or two directions. So to me, at least initially, it didn't seem to be that bad. And then fast forward a couple years and I shoot one under night vision. And I'm like, this is amazing. This is the coolest thing ever. Shooting a non-comped handgun under night vision always, and of course, I had better night vision when I shot with comp than when I did before, but I've gone back since and tried comped and non-comped guns under night vision and found that under night vision, the compensator gun is really the way to go. Now granted, that's a very niche reason for comping a handgun, but it is one more reason in the plus column for compensated handguns. And of course, it's the newest thing, like everybody's throwing a comp on their gun and taking photos of it in their hand with their donut or whatever. And that's fine, like that's what that person wants to do, cool. Uh, we may even rib each other about it and that's fine too. I have compensated handguns, not a big deal. The, what I found though is my old arguments for not liking the comp and having negative things to say about the compensator was because I didn't understand it, I didn't use it. Uh, just recently I had the opportunity to shoot a bunch of different guns, comped and non-comped, on a high-speed camera, 10,000 frames per second. Compensators are awesome, that's all I can say. Uh, they do significantly reduce the recoil on your standard pressure self-defense rounds and your plus pressure self-defense rounds. Uh, what is re reduction of muzzle flip, if you will, or, or, or muzzle rise, if you will, do for you? Well, get you your sights back faster. The gun is going to cycle and load the next round, usually before the firearm settles. The faster the firearm settles, the faster I can fire a next aim shot. So compensators are going to be, well, they're here to stay, definitely, especially today's age when people are looking more and more into the higher functioning side of things. Not to say they didn't in the past, it's just today we have such an instant access to information, things move along much faster. I mean, look at the Lumen Wars, just as an example. Flashlights have gotten brighter faster in the past 10 years than they did in the 10 years before that, and the 10 years before that, and the 10 years before that, so on and so forth. 
So compensators are something you're going to start to see, maybe even OEM. Uh, I hear Glock is getting ready to bring back out the uh, ported Glocks, what they call the you know the, the C model, their compensated model. So it's it's going to be here and it's going to stay. If you're one of those guys like, well, you got a comp a nine millimeter, maybe it's not a nine millimeter, maybe it's 40 cal. I think if you shoot a 40 cal, you might want to throw a comp on it because that pressure curve is ridiculous. Or just shoot nine millimeter and then just solve that problem. Um, there's no such thing as too little a recoil. So anything I can do to reduce recoil is something I'm okay with. Now, am I gonna carry a comp gun 24 seven? I don't really know yet, and I'm just being honest. I'm still not 100% sold on using one for everyday carry, but I'm getting close to saying, yeah, if I can get the right configuration to gun with the right compensator, it would probably be something I would carry every day on duty and for self-defense. So that's been three things that I used to believe. Uh, obviously my opinion has changed since. I think if you've been following the channel for a little while, you are, you're already like, wow, I didn't know, I didn't think he, he must have always thought this way. It's not true. Uh, everybody, if they're honest with themselves, knows that they believe something now that they didn't once believe before. Uh, or their mind has just been changed. Sometimes it's not so such a uh, black and white issue of I was wrong and now I'm right. It was I've adjusted the way that I think about something to refine my opinion or refine the facts that I knew or gather more facts so it changes my opinion more of a middle of the road to a pro or a con. Uh, and this is something I'm continually going to work on. Like I always want to know because my favorite thing is to learn something. Like wow, I just learned something new. That's that's awesome. That, to me, that's a very euphoric feeling to be like, this is knowledge that I will now have if I keep using it for the rest of my life. And I didn't have it seconds ago, or minutes ago, or hours ago. And I've always felt that that's pretty cool. And that's kind of why I'm a little bit of a geek when it comes to certain stuff like that. But uh, I'll probably do another one of these videos in the future, especially if things I might know now uh, change. Uh, and that's just you know my attempt to be as honest and open as possible, especially you know given my profession, um, to make sure that people are seeking knowledge from me know that I'm open-minded enough to admit when I'm wrong. I'm Aaron Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.